Welcome back to Just Giants with Grump and the Cranky Fan, the best damn podcast for the best damn football team. I am your host, the Football Grump, and with me as always is Mike, the Cranky Fan. Hey Grump, greetings from Fort Wayne, Indiana, where I'm trying to get as far away from the stink of last Thursday as possible. So, uh, what are we, four days removed from that game Thursday night, and it's still very painful. I had a, I had a rough weekend, Grump. I saw... You know, the Giants blow a game. My Gators, a heartbreaking loss to Bama. It's been tough. So I mean, those are uh, those are wildly different emotions, right? I mean, that's oh, like sure. the Giants you expect to win. Florida, I mean, against Alabama, you're pushing for it. But oh, yeah. you go in there, you know, you're feeling but, like a loss is coming. Yeah, but you know something? With seven minutes left and it's a one-possession mm-hmm. game, you're kind of like, we can beat these pricks. Yeah. So it wasn't like... It wasn't like Thursday night where I laid in bed for three hours in a catatomic state thinking the world was over. Uh, but still, it's just, you know, the, you run the gamut of emotions for it. It's just the gray hairs are just popping out of this melon every day from these teams. So. Oh, man. I fucking – I hate – prime time games i hate losing them and i'll you got if you if you went you got that long shitty drive back where you just there's nothing else to think about at the end of the day you know what i mean like mm-hmm. you, you can try and think about your day tomorrow but you're not gonna and then when you go to the at least this is my experience when i go to the office and the, the giants lost on prime time i have like the same frustrating conversation with like 20 people in my office where like yeah. half of them are roasting me and then half of them are like, what's wrong with this team? And then they list a bunch of really dumb stuff and name players from two years ago and stuff. So <laughs> I, I can't stand losing on prime time. This one sucks. But, I, I you know, at the same time, I kind of – I'm not going to tell you I saw the ending coming. But I, I felt the blowing it coming. I mean, really, truly, this defense can't stop – jack shit if you can't stop taylor heineke you can't stop anybody in the nfl not one person yeah if you know something though that's that's all fine and all but you know this is you know i always say it you know losers lose Mm -hmm. this may not be a bad team this is a losing team yeah and the only way you break being a losing team has got nothing to do with who the coach is nothing to do with the general manager the players or the quarterback or the price of tea in china it's you got to win it's just you mojo. To you you got to win and get mojo. You have to win games. Yeah. I mean, you know, now what's happened is the Giants have become the Jets. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've, you've seen the memes in the last couple of days of, you know, who are the worst teams in the league for the last five years. Now, how Buffalo has more wins than the, the Jets and the Giants combined, you know, and all those things. And we've become that that losing stink of a team that the Jets are. And maybe it's just because we live in the same building. I, I, I don't know, but we we are them and they are us right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, and what's frustrating is that they're not that bad, like you said. I'm not saying that they're a good team or a great team, but I watched the Jets yesterday throw three picks on four drives, okay? The Giants aren't that bad, but it doesn't matter because they lose just as fucking often. So what's the difference, really? You know, winning, yeah. losing close games or losing in blowouts. You know, what? what is the – is that um Shawshank Redemption, the, the quote, hope is a dangerous thing, hope can kill a man? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's right there. That's the difference between Giants and Jets is hope. Yeah, um, I mean, here, here, here the numbers are the numbers. You know, the Bills have – they've won 39 games since 2017. The Jets and the Giants have won 36 combined since 2017. The Jets and the Giants are tied for the worst record in the NFL with 18 and 48. I mean, that's... That's bad. That, that's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, every offseason we see actual improvement. I mean, there's not a whole lot of head-scratching moves. You know, we don't see them clean house constantly and flip the entire roster like we see the Jets do. But at the end of the day, who cares if the result is the same? I, I mean, the frustration is out of control. And... What's really annoying is that they've done a really good job of getting a good defensive coordinator and great defensive talent at, at big cost. And it was cost that we all agreed upon was necessary. Leonard Williams played out of his ass. He earned that money. James Bradbury earned that money. Blake Martinez earned that money. You know, they, they added Dory Jackson to be the icing on the cake back there. And it ain't his fault. And I don't think it's any of the players' faults on defense. I think... Well- Patrick Graham has just gone a little 
drunk with power and what he's trying to do with his scheme. It's clearly not working with the corners it's, way off the line of scrimmage. Everyone's it's, it's in very, very soft it, it, coverage. It's a very conservative scheme that's trying to prevent the big play from happening. And, you know, it's – usually you do bend, don't break. You know, you tighten up when you get closer to the end zone. But right now that bend, don't break is backfiring a little bit. And this – remember that word I just used, conservative. I'm going to bring that up again for something else we're going to talk about later. I'm going to tie it all together to a theory that I have. But let, let's keep talking for now. Yeah, I, I'm going to – I'm going to try and – no, I'm going to go right to it. I, I, I'm officially giving Patrick Graham a fart for this game. I, I think it's safe to say at this point that James Bradbury has not regressed. I think he's just being played out of his skill set, and I don't really know why because not a single player in this defense is really playing well. And I don't know what it is about the scheme that's being screwed up. I mean I'm not that smart, but it seems to just be soft coverage. Just like like Charmin level soft of just being way off. I mean Taylor Heineke is with full confidence throwing downfield and completing. I mean there's that alone. I mean why are we not throwing the kitchen sink at Taylor Heineke? It doesn't yeah. have to be a blitz every play, but throw something confusing at him. I mean some of the uh, make we, the we, guy think. Make the guy. That's the thing we always talk about players like on our own teams and stuff. It's like. They're thinking too much out there. They just need to play. Well, mm-hmm. put the other team in that position. Do they have to think? Especially a, a young quarterback who's only played in a, a handful of games, who hasn't been prepped all offseason to start. He's not good. Yeah, he's not good. He, if he's good, he'd be a starter somewhere. Or exactly. Yeah, somebody would have spent money last year after the playoff game. You know, there's always that one dumb team that does that. You know, I call it Scott Mitchell disease. You know, you watch three or four games and you sign him a big contract after. Um, but nobody did. He's a backup. But you let They went out and home. signed Ryan Fitzpatrick to not play him. Exactly. Yes. To be a placeholder for when they eventually get their quarterback of the future. Right. You're right. That, that's, what, that's what his own organization thinks about the guy. And what do we do? We make life as easy as possible for him. I it's it's incredibly frustrating. This defense is pathetic. The fact that Heineke performed admirably in the playoffs last year, etc., that's completely irrelevant to me. This is a new game with a new defense. But what are we afraid of? Again, yeah, really. And, okay, he played, quote-unquote, relatively well. But all of a sudden, is this the second coming of Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, uh I don't know. Joe Montana all wrapped into one? No. Taylor Heineke is close to, if not the worst starting quarterback in the NFL that is not a rookie. Yeah, I'll buy that. Yeah, really. I mean, that his stat line is unacceptable. It's not acceptable. I won't accept that result. That's not good enough. Um, Patrick Graham, I, I don't know. Here's where I'm going to dial it back. And this is, this is the benefit of having this podcast not be immediately after the game. And I'm not talking about like we waited all the way until Monday. I mean like, you know, normally we wait a full day. And the reason why is for this moment of clarity. It's important to remember that as bad as the defense was, I am hesitant to label it a trend given that they had a poor week one performance and then all of three days to figure it out. And I don't blame them for... I don't. I, I can't blame Patrick Graham for being like, guys, the scheme works. This is what we did wrong this week. He doesn't have time to just change everything that they've worked on all summer. So I will – I mean he gets a fart. A fart is a fart. That was a fart performance. Patrick Graham earned that fart, and it is what it is. But I'm not ready to just say that we made a mistake retaining him. He's a terrible defense. None of that is is going to happen after this performance. We can revisit that at the the quarter mark of the year, which there's no quarter mark anymore. We're two seventeenths into the season. I hate that. What? I, I just so- just uh, the irrational <laughs> fraction or whatever. But it's the truth. Yeah, I mean, no, I know. I hate that. It you know, just sucks. You know, and, and I was arguing with somebody over the weekend, and I don't remember if it was even about the Giants or the Gators. It was one of the two things where, you know, you don't evaluate. You know, the mayors are not evaluating on any individual play, any individual game. 
they were going to evaluate over the entire body of work. And so if you think like, oh, Graham's defense sucks, he sucks, look at happening in this game, that's going to make all the decisions. Every individual game is just a data point and all the data points you need to make decisions about everything. Mm-hmm. So this was bad. Last week was bad. But they're almost kind of like a double album. It's They're not two separate releases coming out every three years. It's basically the same sessions where they – because you don't have to really time to prepare for one game or another. So you know, my opinions of anybody doesn't change after one game. Um, you know, like you said, maybe after the uh, the uh, the four seventeenth poll, we'll we'll have a uh, where are we now with this organization and this team, and so are we starting to see a trend? But yeah, uh, even in the heat of the anger after the game, I wasn't thinking like, oh, you know, we made a mistake. Graham should have got the head coaching job here or this or that. But damn, no, me either. <laughs> no, but it's, it also, it's incredibly frustrating. I mean, the oh. one drive, I mean, late in the fourth quarter, I'm not talking about the very end on the, the game-winning field goal. I mean, they gave up a bomb to McKissick. I mean, one giant chunk play. In, 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 what the f- are you? Are we playing defense? Is Tay Crowder just racing as fast as he can behind him in man coverage? I, I, I don't I don't know. I, I uh, I, I don't want to pretend that I'm smarter and say that they should be doing this or that, but something changed where the same and now better, more improved defensive roster got worse. And I'm not buying the Dalvin Tomlinson not being here is the problem. I'm not buying that. Um, just as a heads up as you're watching this, at the same moment, for those of you who also follow baseball, my Tampa Bay Rays are about to blow a four-run lead in the ninth. So if you see me all of a sudden get an extremely red face and go off into a spastic, uncontrollable fit of rage, you'll know what happened. So just a, a heads up. <laughs> Headphones on. Is the steam going to come out of your nose instead of your ears? Ex- yeah, who, who knows? So just to, keep, just to keep you aware, I have the second screen on. I'm just keeping one eye on that. So, But you know something? Here is something I think has changed. I don't know if it's necessarily that it's changed, but maybe a trend over, you know, 18 games is developing. It may not necessarily be Patrick Graham. It may not necessarily be, you know, whipping boy Jason Garrett where you don't like the play calling for being too conservative. Maybe it's just Joe Judge is just a very, very conservative coach, overly conservative, which is impacting play calling impacting the defensive scheme we have to prevent the worst case scenario you know big play from happening preventing the the turnover on offense or something i'm starting to think that this is more a top-down philosophy of this team which is maybe impacting what graham is trying to call on defense what jason garrett's trying to call on offense things like that What, what do you think you think that's possible I think it is possible, but I don't think it's his nature. And I'll I'll explain this a little bit more. Um, I do think that Joe Judge likes to be aggressive, and I do think that he likes to throw a surprise. I mean, last year we ran a trick play on a punt against Dallas where uh, Evan Ingram was secretly lined up way against the sideline and just ran a go route. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that... Well, Does, that's I, not a play call that comes from Thomas McGough. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, but again, though, again, just to my point that I just made before, like, I don't evaluate every individual game. It's just one day. No, 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 point. me either. Those me are either. individual plays. Right, right. No, no, no. I think in I'm his. About it. No, I, I get you. I get you. Let, let, me, let me elaborate. I think that's who he wants to be. But to your point about just the stink of losing. I think he wants to get a win under his belt because they played the safer, just as you said, to try and get the win here. And I think also it's possible that while Joe Judge wants to be aggressive offensively, he doesn't trust the offensive line. He doesn't trust Joe Judge to not turn the ball, uh, uh, Daniel Jones to not turn the ball over when he gets hit, etc. It's possible. I don't know that that's the truth, but I will buy that it's possible that he wants to play conservative until he feels that rhythm that now his team is clicking and now he can kind of take the uh, the training wheels off, you know, take the uh, the batting weights off and really swing for the fences. 
Um, I think that's possible, but I don't. I don't think that it's his actual nature to be conservative. I think he's trying to start that winning culture and then let things roll. You know, get on a roll, and then we'll. Well, then we'll screw well, around with the. Well, then this goes back to a discussion we had last week. Is in preseason, are we spending too much time with talent evaluating and not getting this team ready? Like, why are we still trying to see if this team can start rolling? We're getting into week three now, when the season might be over. No, I mean I'm I'm that well, well, wait. That's partly a fair point, but also footnote Thursday night game week 2. So I, I understand that, but I mean because I mean the did did Washington, did Washington play with that same conservative way? No, but I mean Ron, Ron Rivera is not that guy anyway. Ron Rivera right. would would throw down field with me. He'd have me yeah. throwing 70-yard bombs, and I would get I it about maybe 40 yards, I guess. I know, but again, I'm not making my definitive statement that this Joe Judge is what he is. And also, mm. is that even bad? I mean, maybe that's, you know... Eh. Bill, I mean, Bill Parcells was kind of a conservative coach. Uh, again, at times. I mean, he would... Yeah, yeah. He, he would, in pressure situations, call some trick plays. And I know that those are individual plays, but I mean... Those weren't just like, eh, it's nothing, nothing. I mean, like, those were games on the line moves, and yeah, oh, that's that's play, some chutzpah. A trick play is a trick play, but, like, again, after the interception, mm-hmm. he played, that game was played, like, okay, I know I got three points in my back pocket. I yeah, I mean, they're doing, starting at the 19-yard line. I'm not doing anything that might prevent, and, and again, perception is reality maybe he has that little bit of that perception about you know perceived fumbling issues with daniel jones i'm gonna get into that fumbling perception with daniel jones in a minute also but Mm -hmm. maybe that all plays into and he's just like i you know i i let's get out here with the three points and hope my defense comes back to win i mean that's not that wasn't just conservative though that was bad i mean that was bad time management they had two minutes and 16 seconds they called and washington had all three timeouts they called two running plays and then not only did they call a passing play but one short of the sticks so when it was incomplete it ended with two minutes and one second washington didn't even need to burn their third timeout i mean that was really bad really 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 bad. bad And but, not for nothing, not, they weren't running for shit other than Daniel Jones, which they didn't call. I don't know if that would have worked. Maybe maybe at least build that into an audible, see what the defense lines up as, although I'm pretty sure they weren't going to give that up. Um, and, you know, Barkley, he had the big run immediately following the Nick Gates injury, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, he had the big run, but other than that, he still looks like he's rusty and coming back. And in that situation where they were, and at that time— if it's me, I want if and you and you've decided you're gonna run, I would put Booker in there. Because you don't need the big breakaway. I want a power run. Get me four, five yards on that first down play. Now your playbook is open with the clock running and Washington's forced to burn the well, timeout. Well without we're getting into it, I mean the most consistent play and package on this offense right now is Daniel Jones's read option. And yeah, I mean, it was it was really – well, also, I'm going to make us – And you're down there and okay, you're trying good. to – they're trying to run the clock and they're trying to burn time and, you know, do the safe thing. To me, right now, I trust Daniel Jones with the ball in his hands running and making that decision than I do right now of Saquon Barkley running. And it's nothing to do with Saquon. I, I love Saquon Barkley, but he's not back yet. No. And this team hasn't proven that they can run block yet – to move pile and Saquon Barkley will never be that running back. He's not Derrick Henry where he's just going to, you know, I'm just going to bust through the line and get five yards, five yards, five yards. We know Saquon Barkley is two yards, two yards, three yards, 70 yards, two yards, two yards, 12 yards. You know, so that's, that's not the right application for Barkley, even when he's healthy. I don't think. Hmm. I mean, I, I think that's fair. You know what I mean? Barkley's big weapon is that he is, just as dangerous of home run hitter catching the ball as he is running it. That's his big danger. He is not really, and never was, and this was in my scouting report from the 2018 draft, not really a between-the-tackles guy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I feel you there. And, it, and that's fair, but like, whatever. Again, I, I didn't even, even determine if this is a criticism of Joe Judge. It's just we're uh, starting an observation you know, we're, we're, at the, we're at an observation that we, you know a pattern might be developing and we're talking okay we're not talking two games now we're talking 18 games 
you know, is this what kind of coach he is? And it's something to see and just kind of – it helps set your expectations for what this team – what the culture of this team is going to be, you know, and maybe for some fans, they're going to love that. You know, some, you know, you talk to any giant fan, my age, anywhere from Grump's age to my age. And it's like, Oh, big blue, you know, defense and, you know, running the ball and, and, and blue collar giants and stuff. And maybe that's what this team, you know, the culture is going to turn into under Joe judge, as opposed to a Kevin Bill Gilbert offense where Eli's bombs away downfield and stuff. I, I I don't know, but I think that's kind of calibrating your expectations leaves to less disappointment of what you're not seeing, what you think you should be seeing. Whether that translates to a winning any games or winning enough to win a very winnable division remains to be seen. Hmm. And by the way, for all of you Yankee fans who are listening to this, the uh, Rays did beat Toronto, so that helps you guys out and obviously helps us out. So I can go back to breathing again and. Talk about a shitty giant team. <laughs> um, for for all the guff of the two minute offense, which by the way got me a um, earned, earned a fart from me. So Patrick Graham and the two minute offense. Jason Garrett is going to get a star from me, um, and I don't really know who to award this star to. So I don't really care. I'm I, I have to make generalizations about the coordinator and who's in charge and the coach or whatever. So I made one about Patrick Graham. I'm going to make one about Jason Garrett. Now, these are one-game awards, so this is not in the context of anything outside of this game. But not only did he call an aggressive game plan against a tough defense. This is a good defense. But this is a defense, was a defense we were told all offseason is going to win them the division. Yeah, it's true. Um, but he stuck with that game plan even when the worst possible thing happened to the offensive line. I guess the second worst possible thing. So I, I got to hand it to him. You know, he, even though he folded to conservative in the final moments, and I don't know that that's on him and that's not on Judge, but how can I bitch about the other drives? Every other drive was aggressive, even immediately after Nick Gates got hurt. So, I mean, and especially those Jones run calls that you're saying. So even if the move from Jason Garrett was to simply let go and let – jones have more control of his offense i still give him a star for that because it clearly worked so no matter what the move was whether it was an aggressive game plan called by garrett or or he just took the reins off and let jones go or any combination between all of that shit it still earns a star because the offense looked really good and daniel jones is getting a second star for me 22 of 32 for 250 yards and a touchdown plus 95 yards rushing with another touchdown um almost I mean, I'm just going to say, almost a second touchdown with 100 yards, over 100 yards rushing as well. He completely took control of the offense. And he he audibled reportedly. He read the field really well. I think he took shots even when he didn't need to because he saw it was there. He looked comfortable, even behind an, a, a shakier than usual offensive line, which is really saying something. His audibles, play calls, reads, some combination, any of those, they really got the most out of his tight ends, by the way, too. Caden Smith and Kyle Rudolph suddenly looked like tight ends. And they, it's, it's amazing how evident it is that they're useless when their job is to turn around. I mean, getting them to be in motion when they catch the ball, in progress, in stride, is clearly what's needed. They are not quick twitch athletes, but on the move, they can outrun people. And I, I thought it was a good performance from Daniel Jones all the way through the game. I would say for all of his starts, that's the best he's looked by far. I mean, the command of the offense. There were little things, too, little subtle things. Like, did you notice, like, when he was running, as he's about to get hit, he'd, all of a sudden he'd get that extra hand over the ball to just to be a little yep. extra protection? Yeah. That's something, if you go back on the film, you're, you're more of the film guy than me, but may not have been doing that before. Um I want to give you a couple numbers here that you know I got into it on Twitter today with some people. Hmm. Last 322 days, Daniel Jones has seven fumbles in which he's lost three. Exact same numbers as Lamar Jackson. Mm -hmm. The amount same numbers as Josh Allen. In that same time period, red zone fumbles lost. Daniel Jones one fumble. That he lost. Lamar Jackson, one fumble, lost. Patrick Mahomes, one fumble, one lost. Josh Allen, from the 23-yard line in, two fumbles, lost. So, you know, the perception and a narrative that's for, formed at first sight 
will stay with you forever. And Jones had the majority of these fumbles, you know, early on in that 322 day. I mean, really, we're talking about that first season and then like the first couple games of the second season was when it was really bad. And other than that, he's clearly improved. And that's what frustrates me about the headlines is that he's got to clean this up. That's like the narrative. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? He has cleaned it up. He fumbles just about as much as any other quarterback at this point. Right. But the thing is going to be every time he does, it's going to be the, "Ah, I told you so. And I don't know, you know, over time that will go away. But it's just something that as soon as you, you know, you're right. Everybody fumbles. Everybody throws a pick. I mean, Mm -hmm. to ask a quarterback to go, you know, have a clean game with no picks, no turnovers is rare in this league. Happens to everybody. You know. Yeah, Aaron Rodgers throws picks all the time. He just threw one before. Yeah. I mean, so I, I, you know, don't rely on your, your preconceived notions and your prejudices and your narratives. You know, look at the facts. And you know he was he was fantastic. I mean I I don't know what much more you can do to put the ball in the hands of Darius Slayton. Well, to be fair, Slayton is always going to be a boomer bust guy. He had a great touchdown catch, especially the footwork to get the second. When I saw the replay and the trajectory of his right leg, I thought for sure he was going to land about a foot out of bounds. And then he just kind of did like this stab step with his second foot to get in there with beautiful work and the catch too. And the, don't don't do that because it doesn't I, I, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't negate the drop. But I'm just saying that's who he's gonna be. He's gonna make the same catches that he drops. I I have never been on the Darius Slayton bandwagon from the I get beginning. That. I get that. And I, I I've said it on this show a hundred times. I don't trust the guy. And you know, there's a lot of fans who think like, oh, why isn't Slayton should be like our you know, you know, he should be as much promise as Sterling Shepard in this offense. And, like, he's unreliable. And, you know, something, if we are going to kill um, Evan Ingram as yeah. Giant fans and on this show for drops and, and, and mistakes at the most critical times, this guy gets should have all of that same thing as well. And people want to run Evan Ingram out of here as fast as possible. I think he stinks. He makes may make some nice flash plays, but it, for the, the, his role on this team, I require consistency, and I do not get it. And he fails at the biggest moments. That play, game's over if he catches that. Pretty much, you know, is, yeah. it, 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 is Haneke coming back from? You know, we'd have been up, we'd have been up by ten, I think, at, the, at that moment. Something like that, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's a whole different you know, complexion of the game and a whole different philosophy. And there's a lot more pressure on a quarterback at, at that point. And uh, that, that to me is a massive, you know, Sunday morning beer fart from a, a, a weekend <laughs> vendor is what that is. And I, I have no use for the guy. Uh, I mean, it's a huge drop in a huge moment. I'm, I'm right there with you. I can't defend it. And I won't, I didn't put him on either list. Uh, he, he just, just another guy that kind of had but, ups know, and downs in that game. But that's you know, again, that's part of the losers lose. Yep. Thing. I mean, those type of things don't happen to winning teams or teams. You know, and you know, you block a field goal at the end of the game. Uh, I'm sorry, a field goal goes wide right. I mean, a shocker, a Florida State kicker kicks wide right. I could have gone to Vegas for that one and. You know, for as soon as it happens, you see you see people from Washington pointing, and it's like, uh oh. And sure enough, we'll you know, get to that in just a moment. Um, yeah, but I mean, those are all part of the losers lose things. No, like, you're right. These type, of, these type of things happen, and they're not just you know incidental things that happen. They happen at the worst possible time. Yeah, it sucks. Uh, you know, for for everything that Darius Slayton is, Sterling Shepard is the opposite. Um, reliable, consistent, and at, at certain points dominant. I mean, really, in one-on-one situations, I'm not really sure which corner in the NFL that isn't a top five corner can handle him. Really. Um, he continues to play like they drafted a slot guy in the first round. Nine catches for 94 yards. He's such a good route runner. He's you know, such some, a good route runner. 
if you're asking where's Kadarius Tony, and you know you're all quick to blame all the myriad of mistakes and things that's happened to him, one of the things should be that the guy who you no know, that really should be his place, you know mm-hmm. that slot guy is playing right now at a Pro Bowl level after two games. I would so agree that with be, that. Yeah, is that going to be part of the reason? Well, why that's you're not that's seeing him on the as much. I, I have no issues with Kadarius Tony right now, and I have no issues with the coaching staff not playing him for that matter. Um, the dude has barely practiced. Okay, the last thing I need is for him to run a curl when he's supposed to run a go and Daniel Jones throws an interception in a critical moment. I don't need that right now. He no. should get on the field when he's ready to get on the field. And the and the coaching staff have put him on the field. It's not like he's being completely held out. He's got situational plays. I think if he were able to practice all summer, he would be in more in those situations where where you have four wide receivers instead of a tight end and three. You know, instead of 11 personnel, you have four wide. He'd be out there, but he's not. Are we – is our threshold for boom or bust now one game or two games or three games or one rookie season? No. I mean, sure. Not for me. I know you'd love to have him on the field obviously, but you know something? He will be on the field plenty yeah. at, at, when, when the time is right. And quite honestly, this offense is not suffering without him in the lineup right now. I mean, how many points did we score in this game? 29. 29? Should have been more. And it should have been more. I mean, we left, you know, left points on the field, a drop, all this and that. We should have scored in the low to mid thirties against what we've been again, we're told all off season is the best defense in the division. It will win a division. Doesn't matter who the quarterback is, this defense is so great. And you know, they they the improvement from week one to week two, which we always say is the most important one, with all of the you know, the headwinds facing it with the short week and you know, the injuries and blah, 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 blah. Killing the offense for that game. Do you remember when I said this defense was overrated? Good, but overrated? Yes, you did. Yeah. And the reason I said that is because I think that Ryan Kerrigan was more of an important part of this defense than people gave him credit for. And when he left, they didn't really get any better. Chase Young's two most impactful plays in this game, by the way, where he was completely sunned by Andrew Thomas. His most impactful plays were cleaning up a Montez Sweat missed tackle for a loss on a terrible pitch play where he just was in backside pursuit and a roughing the passer penalty. Those were probably his most impactful plays in this game. Chase Young was completely wiped out in this game. Um, So Not the first time. No, it's not. It's probably it's like that. the third time now he's been wiped out. Andrew Thomas is really at this point that seems to be his most comfortable matchup to date. Um, I thought he was a. I thought he was a bust. Uh, I was. Told, I was told he was a bust. Who? Oh, oh, Andrew Thomas. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so, so I've been told on on Giants Twitter quite a bit. Yeah. Um. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw an honorable mention out there. I'm trying. I'm trying to stick with this. I tend to lose it in the middle of the year, but I know you're not gonna give a shit. But Graham Gano, five for five, and that 55 yarder. That was that was on the heels of a timeout on a third and five a false start to make it third and 10, and then another false start to make it third and 15. Daniel Jones just kind of ran up the middle on a pass play and got about 10 of them back. And my reaction when that happened was like, great, we're still punting. This is pathetic. And uh, lo and behold, he drilled a 55-yarder. I mean, five for five on a 55-yarder really kept this team in the game. I I it. It was really it good. Change, a really good kicker changes everything. It changes your whole offensive philosophy. It changes your balls. You know <laughs> what, what you could do. It. So you know, I, I'm talking. You know, I am talking about both, both sides of my mouth here. You know, my am I questioning if Joe Judge conservative, too conservative? And that was a ballsy decision to you know kick the 55 yarder. He, you know, but you know, again, he sees this kicker in practice all the time. We yeah. have tons of tape on what he's done. He's, he's a captain. We, we, we've seen it. With our own two eyes in Charlotte, him banging a 57-yarder to win a game. Mm. So, you know, again, we're not making any definitive statements about anything right now. But, you know, that was a surprisingly bold move by by, uh, Joe Judge, and it worked. I gave a fart to Billy Price. Um, It comes with a bit of an asterisk here. But then I took the asterisk off. Mm. Um, Billy Price had a really, really tough ask to start at center after being here for like a week and a half. I mean, really, that's that's tough. The center has a lot of work. The reason that I think they went with it is because, well, 
We're going to move Nick Gates to left guard. Nick Gates knows all the calls. He'll be right next to him. He'll help him point out the guys in the line. Well, that shit lasted for like a drive and a play. Um, and it's kind of Billy Price's fault that that happened. Billy Price did a pathetic job of trying to block Jonathan Allen, who then, uh, after making a hit on Daniel Jones, rolled up on Nick Gates and his foot was sideways. It's really disgusting. I don't recommend you look it up. Um, yeah, fuck you, Barstool. Because <laughs> once again, those scumbags, you know, they're like, for those of you who didn't see the video, here it is. I mean, yeah. They can eat shit and die, that whole organization. <laughs> I really hate their guts. Um, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> to top it all off, he also had a snap infraction and an illeg- ineligible player downfield penalty, both of which are just normal center things. Um, I guess the snap infraction comes with being with the team for a while, but the ineligible man downfield, he knew it was a pass play. He just kept walking forward. I don't know what he yeah, was doing there. it was there. really strange. It was, I don't know. I, I mean, you could by the letter of the law probably deserves a fart but i i would give leeway to a guy who's you know still feeling his way yeah with this team with this you know in the starting unit switching around positions and stuff so i I don't know i am yeah i i mean my my final little note here on billy price is that i feel a little bad about it because it's such a tough spot to be in but a fart is a fart you know he he played I, I grade them all equally. I mean, he, he started the game and he finished the game, so it's not like it was a series of plays. I mean, he, he really played everything. And by the way, Gates breaking his leg is massive, massive problem. Um, I mean, you're talking about our second best offensive lineman, such an important position. And this is a credit to Daniel Jones, by the way. You could see, I mean, the complete turnaround of this team up tempo first drive. I mean, there was 20 seconds on the play clock and we're running plays. And they were just completely disorganized on defense. That shit was working. And then when that happened, nope. Now Daniel Jones is – he's in the midst of calling audibles and doing everything he was doing well in this game. He's also calling out all of the protections because he doesn't have the benefit of Nick Gates anymore. His interior is Will Hernandez at a new position at right guard. Billy Price on this team for the first time since three weeks – three weeks ago it wasn't here. And Ben Bredesen, same thing. Right. So, I mean – an incredible job by Daniel Jones in a, in a tough situation to help out that interior offensive line. I mean, he's really, at that point, he's not even saying anything in code, I don't think, anymore. He's pretty much just like, block him. You know what I mean? Like, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm going to give, this is going to be my, I think, I think some fans are going to be a little frustrated with how much I don't care about this, but dishonorable mention to the officials. Um. They were bad, but they were bad for both teams. I mean, they were just... And I'm going to be completely objective here and say this was probably the worst officiated game of the weekend. Um, Really, truly. I mean, everything was strange. Um, From spots, to clock stuff, to penalties. It was a friggin' mess. It was all over the place. All over the place. They literally reviewed a play where Antonio Gibson tripped and fell, and they were trying to decide where to spot the ball and in the background as they review it over and over again you can see austin johnson being held so he's just getting mugged and it's happening right next to antonio gibson pretty much as he's getting the handoff he's getting completely turned around it's so frustrating to see it over and over and over again i I feel like we're complaining more and more about the officials as we go on and replay is supposed to help officials but i Mm. i I don't know what it is but i watch it's almost to the point where I feel like, you know, are these games even rigged? Because they're so bad. And I know they're not, but like... I mean, the, I the holding know. call on CJ Board, everyone's going to go to. The the um, the Dexter Lawrence offsides on the field goal to end the game that got called, they're going to point to that. And, and, well, and it's, it's, it's a fair point that, you know, replay... Offsides. No, I mean, the replay proves he moved, but laterally. He didn't cross the the ball. He never crossed the line of scrimmage. So it's a bad call. But at the end of the day, my motto is and always will be, always win by more than what the officials can screw up and take away from you. Yeah, and well, the Darius Slayton drop yeah. is the perfect example of that. I are, This I always complain with my dad all the time about. He's like, well, it shouldn't have been in that position. 100% agree. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, was, I already know what you're going to say. The officials have one job, and it's to get it no, right, and instant replay is supposed to help them. I get no, it. No, no, no. I wasn't even going to go that way. That's, I said that till the cows come home. 
Yes, I 150% agree. It shouldn't come down to one play or one call. But it did. <laughs> so, you know, something – once you're at that point where all oh, it's passes prologue and one play will decide it, get the fucking call right. Yeah. So I, I don't I, – I, two things – see, that's the problem with this world. I'm going to go on a little rant here for a second. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> is that everything in this world now is a binary decision. It's black or white, yes or no, this or that. No, some things are this and that. It's like – it's not a question of you shouldn't have got to that point. I mean, games come down to last. No games for 45 or 55 minutes are defined by one play. There's a whole series of events that happen, and if something happens, a whole other set of circumstances that have it. What is past is prologue. You are here. And if you get to here, it doesn't matter how you got there. You are here. So don't tell me what well, you shouldn't have. Well, it doesn't matter. It's completely irrelevant. It's horseshit. We have supposedly the best officials in the world in the NFL. Now, it's not like it's the best soccer officials you're pulling from every country in the world, but the best ones of all the peewee, <laughs> junior high, high school, college, semi-pro, arena league, Canadian football, whatever, you should have the best officials in the world doing this sport, this league. You have the technology in replay that you can review something. As if something is wrong, you can correct it. How they're implementing replay can always be tweaked and always be improved, but the potential for getting as many right calls as possible is there, and we're continuously missing the mark, and I don't understand it, and it frustrates the shit out of me. I'm tired of it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's true. I mean, you're right. I mean, every year we have, I would say every week, right, there's one game with one really bad blown call that fans from across the league Fans that have nothing to do with either team are like, yikes, that's a terrible call. You know, every and, and, single and, and, and week we and see it's that. Not even, and it's not even wins or losses or making the players not the playoffs. Again, this how many freaking commercials did you see this week for DraftKings? How many, you know, if you watch ESPN, the ticker, all it is is it's point spreads and over-unders and everything. There's shows dedicated to gambling and all that stuff. The league is actively pushing you to spend more money to gamble on their sport for more revenue. How can you have the officiating in this game that where there's so much money involved be just arbitrary and just flat out wrong? I mean, people, I mean, there are people out there going to have their, their kneecaps broken this weekend because of a wrong call. I mean, we don't want these guys' knee. We don't want thumbs broken we don't want the mob <laughs> are you talking you about know? like bookies and like sure yeah. <laughs> of course i mean only think someone in vegas is gonna come beat the shit out of you I, I had no idea what you were talking I, about for a moment i don't think that i don't think that jesse cofield whatever the hell her name is you know she's not gonna come to your house and beat the shit out of you but you know for the for, you know for the, the the billions spent in vegas there's hundreds of billions spent on the, you know on the black market with bookies and you know if you get a call wrong or something like that when you bet something and you thought you won I don't know. It's just get the fucking calls right. There's so much writing on this. There's there's championships and there's TV money and there's ratings and there's gambling and bonuses and, 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 and contracts and reputation. Just legitimacy. What are we separating the NFL from the WWF from? Legitimate. The NFL is a legitimate sport. That's a bunch of horseshit that's predetermined. <laughs> you don't want the perception of this not, you know, oh, this is like fucking wrestling. You don't want that. No one's going to care anymore. I will say the, one of the most frustrating things is visibly watching, especially if you've ever watched a football game with someone who doesn't watch football like at all, and they 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 like know the basic rules, but they don't watch. Watching officials spot the ball, I mean, it is completely arbitrary. They just kind of eyeball whatever, and they, and you can see them like move the ball and it's like mm, over here, like it's ridiculous. Why did you do that? I don't understand that. And then and then let's. Use a, a chain system they've been using since 1893, where <laughs> we have, two, as humans, developed rockets <laughs> like this. Right? We can figure out things to the, the millionth of a second. We have the technology to figure out. We have. We play tennis at the U.S. Open, where they have microchips in the friggin' balls, and we know in 0.3 seconds, in or out, they go to that little screen. And they're like, whoop, out here. No, two old men who can barely even walk are walking like this. And oh, okay, I guess he missed it by. 
this much. Yeah. Spot the ball here. And it, it, the ball could be bouncing. If you do like a GPS tracker on where the ball goes from the end of the play to where they actually hike it from, it probably does this all over the fucking place. It's not right. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand really. it. I, I, I we've we've developed rockets that can land back on the planet, and <laughs> we, we can't. We we are still having humans eyeball things. That spaceship that went up this past week had no pilots. It was all done by computers. They had four people in there who were civilians just sitting there. They didn't do anything. <laughs> but we can't figure out how to spot a freaking football and determine it's a first down or not. It's, it's terrible. It, you know, it, 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 I don't know if it's because. The referee union so strong, you know. I don't think that's it. Since they played games without him a couple of years ago, so um, yes. you know, look, I, all of what we just said is, is valid, and uh, and it's frustrating. But this game comes down to a lot more than I mean, and and this is what I said, you know, literally to my girlfriend on the couch, who I came out of the bathroom and I was like, well, this is the game. He's going to kick a field goal, and she goes, he might miss. And my honest to God reaction was, even if he does, this game was so bad. They let him just move right down the field and kick another field see, goal. See, so remember something. I, this is the NFL. College has so much perception backed around it that even if you win, you could lose. You know, you may drop in a poll. The, the, I uh, understand the, that. But I you know, do. So in the NFL, again, what's past this prologue? You could play total shit for sixty minutes. The bottom line is if, 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 if we didn't jump off sides in that, we would be 1-1, one 1-0 and one, one and in division, 1-0 mm-hmm. and o in the conference. We don't have these goddamn memes comparing us to the Jets. All of this stuff kind of goes away right now. But guess what? We did. In spite of a Florida State wide right special given to us on a platter, we are 0-2. We've been 0-2 for the last 73 years in a row. You know, now all of a sudden – the playoffs are in scary, you know, position. We may not, you know, we may have meaningless games again in November. You know, the world is coming to an end. I'm, I'm sick of it. Yeah. And I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it's just, again, this how we started. Are we just a bad team or just a bunch of losers? Or are we both? We're definitely a bunch of losers. And I don't know if we're a bad team or not too early to tell. But I'm not excited. I'm not happy. No. Yeah, and, and like I said, I, I'd take that win any day if he doesn't jump off sides and the, the field goal is missed. I'm I'm taking that win. We're doing it. But even, I mean, we, we'd have a happier sounding episode here, but that weekend that just passed, I'm still not thrilled about everything I saw. And that's, you know, I'd be lacing into Patrick Graham. I'd probably be more angry about it because we won – on, on a, a fluke missed field goal. I mean, I guess it's not a fluke. It's kind of a far kick, right? He missed it. No, he, he didn't miss a 23 yard. He didn't miss an extra point. That was a legitimate kick. Yeah. I, I, I no. don't know. It, it, just, it's, it was the defensive performance, especially in crunch time when it mattered most, allowed Taylor Heineke to twice drive down the field and answer. And that, to I've, me, I've is been, unacceptable. I'd have been reviewing it like when you give somebody at work constructive criticism. It's like, you know, I like you, but here's how you can make things better. That's the way we'd have been analyzing this game as opposed to, you know, just being like, you dumb fucks. Like what you, you, you are right now. It's it's perception. It's it's kind of how you, you know, it's easier to review something after a win. I mean, I, I guess, but I mean, yeah. that kind of constructive criticism is akin not- to congratulating your child for going to school, yeah. but even though he shit his pants. We're not, we're not good enough, and we're not, you know... We're not at that level where we can sort of being like not happy about wins, and it's yeah. a sad state of affairs. True. It's yeah, like, right. believe me, I guarantee you, if they would have that, could, we would have been like, thank God, you know something. I'm just gonna go to sleep, and I'll worry about this tomorrow. I'm gonna take That's that true. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna snuggle up with it for in bed tonight. Tomorrow, well, we'll reassess what happened, but it's kind of like, it, it, it's. There'd have been nothing. You'd have been like, okay, there's some cause some concern about this going forward, but not in the way of like, not happy or disappointed in the way we did. It's just, this is just, you know, how are we gonna lose next week? <laughs> how are we, how are we gonna fuck this up next week against opponent X or opponent Y? It's, you, you know, we do all the analysis we're gonna do. We're gonna break down the game on on the Thursday show. 
you know, why we should beat Atlanta, why they're terrible. But, you know, something in the back of my mind, is there going to be a, uh, a turf gremlin that's going to stop somebody who's going to fall down from running to break away for a touchdown? Or, you know, is the wing going to blow a certain way? Or is Daniel Jones going to have a bad fumble at the wrong time? I'm, I'm like almost expecting – we're becoming Jet fans. That's what the worst thing about this is. It's, it's really true. We've morphed into the other team that plays at Giant Stadium. We're look. We're expecting bad things to happen. This is bad. You really took a sledgehammer to the Segway game. That was really good. So I mean, uh, that's that's you know, that's about all I can say about this game without getting too analytical, which is you know, upcoming whatever. Um, but <sighs> deep breath. This is, this is four fucking days after the game. Yeah. I thought we'd be. I thought we'd be calm. And just the more you think about it, just the the blown opportunity and the self-imposed blown opportunity makes you really frustrated and just kind of put your hands up in the air like what the hell i mean is it all for naught is it is it what's the point of all of this you know they're just gonna kind of keep shooting themselves in the foot it's got to turn around yeah and I'm, I'm hoping that it turns around next week against the falcons it's eli manning day so thursday we're gonna have another episode for you same place soundcloud spotify itunes google play etc and also on youtube now as well i hope you guys are enjoying that i'm also doing a new thing on there we're adding additional content with the the the, the defining drive where i uh analyze a super important drive or drives that impacted the result of the game directly um so you can check all that stuff out there and of course follow me on twitter at football underscore underscore grump and you can follow him at the cranky fan on twitter as well yeah underscore she yeah yeah. yeah. (laughs) i've done a lot of talking in like the last four hours so (laughs) yeah there's a lot to to discuss i mean follow all three uh twitter feeds because you know we got a lot going on you know there's so much to talk about with this giants team you know i got so much to talk about you know we're getting into silly season for october where it's everything going on just uh, give us a follow and uh you know pump us up on youtube I'm, I'm glad you guys are watching and enjoying it thanks for the, the very positive feedback we've had oh for uh, real we'll yeah have, thank you all the feedback has been good too we'll have some exciting guests coming up soon and some surprise appearances in other places you know as part of uh the giants pod fam which I, i've coined this evening you know we're all <laughs> there's so many good shows out there and uh we're all friends and stuff and we all want giant fans to be smarter than all the other dumb fans that are out there so yeah we appreciate all the support like and subscribe guys all right everyone we're gonna see you we're gonna record thursday night so we'll see you friday morning for the preview show against the atlanta falcons we'll see you there on youtube or if you just like to listen itunes spotify google play etc all right everyone go giants go giants